The Situation Room has commended the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, for conducting a transparent election in Edo State. The convener of the Situation Room, Enes Wankwa, commended INEC and other stakeholders while speaking to newsmen in Abuja. Wankwa says despite successes recorded in the election, that the Situation Room observed some cases of intimidation of voters, electoral violence and vote buying. He, however, called for an improvement of the electoral process. Efforts at mediating peace and reducing political tension mounted by INEC, the police, the National Peace Committee, the Benin Monarch, the Oba of Benin, and civil society groups paid off. These efforts commend themselves to future elections. The incidence of vote buying during this election was high. The situation calls for a more effective enforcement of election laws that prohibit vote buying and other election offenses. Uh, particularly, the situation calls on the National Assembly to move quickly and urgently and proceed with legislative action to ensure passage of the Electoral Offenses Commission Bill, which would create the agency to enforce election or uh, respect for election laws. And we are now joined by Michelle Lagatisa, a legal practitioner, to, of course, have a quick conversation about this. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Can you hear us, uh, Mr. Lagatisa? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thanks for joining us. Uh, let's quickly get into it. W what is your general assessment of the process um, of the just concluded Edo State elections? Uh, away from, of course, what seems to be the mantra of it being an end to Godfatherism. Okay, well, um, thank you for having me. And uh, in respect to that question, um, I'll say that, you know, many of the commentators have spoken to the fact that the elections were generally free and fair. And um, that is something to be grateful for because before the elections, you know, the constant statement was with the jumpy violence on the horizon. And uh, we did not see that. However, um, as a country, we need to ensure that we increase the bar, right? Um, what we say that there was free and fair elections and there was lack of violence still had some pockets of violence. You know, um, we still had reports of vote buying, which is um, an illegality. Um, under the Electoral Act. Um, and we also still had um, some occurrences of violence. Um, I hear that an INEC official um, was macheted on her face and another one was shot. So um, until we eliminate that, um, it's not yet a call for celebration. But even while we can say it's not yet a call for celebration, we must um, accept the fact that this is um, significant progress um, in our electoral journey. All right, brilliant. And, and, and I haven't listened to uh, uh, politicians. I, I, I want us to take a more um, objective look at it. What are the lessons that you feel like uh, we must learn from this election? Well, um, I think um, three critical lessons that we must learn from this election. Number one is the fact that um, at the end of the day, power belongs to the people. Um, one of the critical reasons that turned the tide for um, Governor Godwin Obaseki was the feeling that um, he was unjustly uh, disqualified from the APC primaries and that it was hounded down. Now, the truth or um, lack of truth of whether there was actually a Godfatherism battle is a matter I do not want to go into um, because that would then delve into partisan um, alignments. Um, but that being said, the uh, message that um, came across to the people was that, look, um, you know, this person was unjustly hounded, and um, that led to the mantra of Edo no Lagos, which was basically the people saying they did not want to have an ambody like situation where, you know, um, they felt or perceived that, um, you know, a leading um, light in the party, and by the way of Lame um, Tinubu, um, orchestrated his exit. And um, that's one lesson. Uh, the second lesson is about uh, competence and deliverer. Uh, one of the critical things that um, Governor Godwin Obaseki was able to leverage on was um, his perceived record. Um, he goes by the nickname of Wake and See Governor in Edo State, which basically means that, um, you know, he doesn't talk a lot. Um, and when you wake up, you see infrastructural developments. 
Um, again, as to whether, in fact, there are enough infrastructural developments to say that the scorecard is at the level that we should begin to celebrate is another conversation that I would not like to delve into. But that perception that he was a hardworking governor that was working for the people and defending the interests of the people um, was also able to swing the tide and led to the celebrations and jubilatory mood that we saw across the state. Now, the third lesson that we also need to learn is the fact that um, it appears that, you know, in terms of um, 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 Nigeria's democracy and how we begin to, um, should I say, develop or grow in our democracy, we're seeing more and more um, examples where people can point to and say that, wait, um, our votes can actually make a difference. Um, once upon a time, we did not know that we could um, vote out a sitting government in the person of Goodluck Jonathan. And now the people feel that, well, actually, we can also vote out, um, should I say, vested interests or those who control the political class. Because um, no matter the fact that Godwin Obasek is now a second term governor, he's still perceived as an outsider in the political process, it's not yeah. a typical grassroots politician. And for someone like that to upstage who we would consider to be the traditional grassroots politicians, for me, is more of a message to the people um, that, in fact, you know, power does belong to the people. And um, as we develop, we'll see more of those instances in the future. Right. So those are the three critical lessons I would like to put forward. Well, ni nicely put. I, I, I want to quickly also bring in uh, uh, Biodun Shomumi, he's a political analyst. Uh, thank you for joining us. Yeah, good morning. Uh, quickly also, what is your general assessment of the process um, of the Edo elections? Um, of course, everyone you know seems to have that same, I believe a lot of people had the mantra of it being an end to Godfatherism. Um, but what was your assessment of the process? Uh, well, um, <clears throat> honestly speaking, I don't share that optimism that um, what happened in Edo would end Godfatherism. No, it has nothing to do with that, clearly. Um, I think people have been too um, over um, stating what actually happened. Um, in, from my own viewpoint, uh, it's so clear that, look, the Oshiomole created an image, you know, about Izeyamo. That image lasted for four years. And then overnight, Oshiomole brought Izeyamo again, and then now said it was somewhat, something else. So people are not stupid. It's so clear. The videos were played time and time again. The audio was everywhere. And at the end of the day, uh, people can see the insincerity of politicians. And because of that, the Edo people refused to fall you know, for the hook. They decided to say, no, you can't keep manipulating us. That is a statement being made. It's not about godfatherism. Because when you look at Edo, in fact, a major influence in Edo politics is Oba, Obenin who can influence things one way or the other. Number two, they also brought out the contradiction of Oshomole himself, who was actually challenging Godfatherism of Tony Anini. All these issues were brought out to show that Oshomole, you know, uh, is double talking. He's talking from the two sides of his mouth. A lot of it is not about the performance of um, Godwin Obaseki, far from it. It was, there was a perception that Obaseki was resisting sharing goodies. And because he was not doing that, that led to a major rift with Oshiomole. Those are the issues at work. Do not forget the last election in Edo State was very, very close, the 2016 election was very, very close that the case was decided in court through, you know, timing out of the uh, count ballots. So yeah. PDP had always been very strong in Edo states. And because of that, moving into PDP with some support from APC, um, Albaseki was bound to win.
All it right. has nothing to do with God, Godfatherism the way we are stating it. All right, hold on. Now, you, you already, you know, moved in that direction, so I'm going to go ahead and bring this up. The, the general narrative out there is that the APC lost to itself, primarily from the style of leadership of the former national chairman, Adam Sushomole, of course, former governor of Edo State also, who is also mm. accused of being responsible for some of their losses in Zamfara and Rivers and um, other elections. Do you agree with that? Oh, yes. The What happened in Edo is a battle between APC. APC in Edo is divided. Two fa factional chairmen, and not only that, you can see that some APC governors, you know, overtly or covertly supported Obaseki. It was clear. I mean, if you know what happened behind the scene, you will really understand the what happened in um, Edo is not about that. It's a continuation of a battle. It's about 2023. Is about the presidential ambition of 2023. Is about who will choose the delegates, you know, that will vote at the convention in 2022 to determine the presidential candidate. That is what is going on in Edo, and that is what would happen in Odo politics. Is the two tendencies within APC that went to war, and one faction decided to match with PDP. Don't be surprised, six months down the line, if Obaseki returns to APC, it's not impossible. So these are the clear issues. Rather than us overstating it and trying to claim that that's the end of Godfatherism, there's no way Godfatherism will end. All right. Whoever pays the piper dictates the tune. How do you set up the political parties in a way that you need millions to make an impact? Where will people get the millions? No, Are I, people paying I, I membership wanna... fees of any political party? Is it not these godfathers who are sponsoring the political parties? Yeah. Well, hold on, sir. I, I want to bring in uh, Michelle Agatisse to also speak okay. on that. Um, okay. You know, that same narrative that the APC lost to itself okay. and mostly because of... Uh, uh, the style of leadership of the of Adam Sushomole, of course, uh, he has also been yeah. mentioned as being responsible for some of the losses in Zamfara and uh, Rivers and other um, yes, elections. Yeah. So, so, do you agree with that narrative? Yeah, uh, to a very large extent, I do. Um, and in you know, bringing that narrative to the fore, we have to take a step back. Uh, if this was um, a year and a half ago, the candidates for the APC would have been for all the issues that transpired and the like. Um, three things happened that um, clearly showed that, um, you know, the internal um, policies, or should I say the internal wranglings of APC um, was really the fight accompli for the party. The first thing was, in fact, of the, the fact that um, the fight in Edo states became a national battle. As you know, you know, the issues within Edo states then transpired to um, Adam Zoshomole, losing his seat as national chairman um, for the mere reason that he was suspended from his World One. Secondly was the fact that um, it appeared that there was a vendetta um, from Oshomole and his faction against um, Godwin Obaseki. And um, Godwin Obaseki, um, you know, for the public gallery, played his cards right. Because if you remember, it wasn't a situation that um, Obaseki defected immediately. Um, he still presented himself to run for the primaries and um, he was disqualified for what many would say was um, very flimsy reasons um, relating to his certificate over which the University of Ibadan has confirmed that indeed he was a you know, duly um, um, graduated from the university. And um, secondly, with respect to his NYSE certificate, um, as to the fact that his name was spelled Obasek instead of Obaseki, and NYSE came and apologized and issued a new certificate. So you could see that um, these were flimsy reasons. Now, APC forgot that there was a watching public. And for the watching public, what they saw was that this man is being hounded out, right? And um, it became the word on the streets of Edo State, on the streets of Benin, on the streets, you know, of Igwebe and the like, that um, this is the Ambody formula. So that is what led to that chant of Edo Nobi Lagos. And, um, you know, Obaseki was good enough 
to um, utilize that chant. So he rode on the wave of, um, you know, and, you know, added in there that, wait a minute, I'm actually competent, you know, when you compare me with the counterparty. And um, that is what, um, you know, Mr. Shoumi um, referred to as to the fact that those videos from four years ago was basically what was just playing over and over and over again, where Shomali accuses um, Izeyama of being a thief, accuses him of being incompetent, accuses him of being a cultist. Now, what does that do? What that does is that politically, for the people in APC, they're like, wait a minute, you know, we've stayed here all the four years. The person that contested against us, who you said on the heat is saying that we should all rally around. But there's only so far you can rally around when you do not believe in a message. And um, a lot of people would say that that lack of belief was their one. Two, two was the issue that um, even among the governors themselves and among the big wigs, I understand that there were apprehensions about the method by which um, Ize Yamu became the candidate and whether that would have led to legal issues down the line. Um, we have seen several instances where the Supreme Court voided elections, etc. And there were issues as to the working committee that actually brought um, Ize Yamu into power and whether that would lead to issues down the line. So all of those combined um, had a real impact right. on the election. And for um, you know, Obaseki, when he went over to the PDP, of course, at the initial stages, there were issues, but, you know, Governor Wike stepped in, other big wigs, including Dan Obi, to unite the House. So you had a united PDP House who, beyond Edo State, saw Edo State as a grand prize, such that the entire South-South and majority of is right. You had an APC where governors said that this was in just blah, blah, blah. They were internal wranglings fighting. So, of course, when you had two heavyweights in Nigerian politics, being the PDP and APC, and one of them not at full capacity, um, it was bound to have an effect All on right, the elections. On. And I, just I on the point of Godfatherism, while we might not say that this has brought it to an end in Nigeria or in Edo State, what it was was that for the people, the message that was sold to the people is that this is a battle for the soul of Edo State that bears on Godfatherism. And the message was that, look, Oshomale fought against Godfathers with Tony Aneni and now wants to install himself. The message, not that that was the truth, I don't know whether that's the truth, but that was the message that was sold. All right, hold and on. that was the message I, I that want was you to go on. Um, hold on, hold on, Mr. So, yeah. I want you to go on, um, you know, still sharing your thoughts. Sure. Um, I think uh, it was uh, Mr. Shoumi who made mention um, earlier that you know, it, it wasn't necessarily about the performance of Godwin Obaseki in the last four years. Um, but of course, because of a totally different narrative. But I want you to go on, Michelle Agatise. Um, the election has come and gone. Now let's look at policies. Um, in your opinion, what new policies do you think Godwin Obaseki should employ at this time to pilot the affairs of the state? Okay, absolutely. Um, in terms of new policies that he needs to employ, um, first of all, we need to look at where we currently are. Um, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, no one can void that fact. And that means that there are economic issues that we have to deal with. There's less revenue coming into the state. There are less investors that will be interested in your state and we have security issues to deal with. Um, as a result of that, um, I think that Godwin Obaseki needs to focus on you know, the economy of the state. Yes, he has spoken about how he's focusing on that, but um, it's, a, it's a new dawn, more or less. It's a new dawn that requires you to belt tighten. It's a new dawn that requires some conservative policies. But it's also a new dawn that needs you to ensure that the welfare of the people of the state um, remains um, at the fore. Now, um, thankfully, Nigeria and many states in Nigeria have not received the full brunt of um, you know, the economic collapse resulting from COVID-19. One, neither have we re received the full brunt of the pandemic in itself, and that is an opportunity in and of itself. Three things. The first thing is with respect to the power plants, um, the mod sorry, the modular refinery that is almost completed. Uh, one expects that you know if they can complete that modular refinery, I understand that it's about 10% left until it's completed. What that does is that it creates a new economy, right, um, in that area. The new economy is beyond just the refinery. It's around the people that are going to come and work there. It's about the service industries that are going to service the people that work there, et cetera. 
uh, what you do is that the private sector is then helping you with the recovery. The second thing is with respect to a system or power plant as well. You know, you have to ensure that not just the fact that it's completed and commissioned, but it's working. Everything has to be working. All these projects have to be working. Azura Power Plant had issues with the lenders, right? And it has been unable to deliver the, should I say, Nirvana that we all expected that the Azura Power Plant will do. Azura Power Plant needs to be efficient. It needs to be working. It needs to be on stream. Now, when you have all these three things working, what it does is that it eases from the public spending, it eases from, you know, um, you know, government having to subsidize things, et cetera. And um, you have an economy in and of itself that sustains employment, um, both directly and both by the service industries that supports those industries, because you would have market sellers there, you would have food sellers, you'd have transportation guys bringing people to work, the critical thing for me is Gele Gele um, Seaport. You know, it's one of the flagship projects that uh, Obaseki has been speaking about, you know, having a state-of-the-art seaport in Edo State. If we're able to complete that seaport, of course, it's not just a state effort, it's also a national effort. You're having to work with national Nigerian Port Authority, etc. When you're able to have that on stream, you ease, um, should I say, pressure on the Papa port ease pressure on 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 air and the like and um, if you're able to have that okay. on stream it brings a whole new um should i say injection into the economy of adjusted because the next four years is going to bank on the economy right, right. if people feel that they are hungry they don't care if you know you fix roads right. All right. Can, can hold hungry, on. they don't care if other yeah, hold on, please. I, I, I want to I wanna then move to, because there's also something that I hope that we'll be able to talk about, um, um, Mr. Agatise, and that is his, uh, uh, um, Governor Basaki's leadership style. Um, um, a lot of people have said it's time for him to build fences and to, you know, uh, fix, you know, whatever bad blood that might exist in um, Edo State's political space. But we'll get back to you um, in a bit. I want to go back to Biodun Shoumi, um, and, and let's now talk about um, the uh, people's engagement. To a large extent, the election has been praised to be a credible one. Um, but to what extent did the people's engagement and participation yield the result that, uh, uh, of course, uh, we have seen um, uh, so far, uh, which we saw, of course, um, a lot of people have acclaimed as the people's will um, a few days ago? Oh, yes. Um, let's put it this way. We must also commend um, uh, INEC for doing a good job. And also, we saw lead to interference, negative interference by security forces under the control of the presidents. Um, yes, the presidency has been able to say, look, this shows our commitment to free and fair elections. Whether this is one off, we don't know. We need to wait and see on though before we can conclude on that. The fact of the matter is, um, when you look at what happened in Edo, is an expression of. Hello. Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, is an expression of the democratic will of the people. Do not forget that this um, government, particularly the federal government uh, mantra, is on anti-corruption. And then you have a situation where Nigerians are so appalled and felt corrupt. Politicians are generally corrupt, and they are the ones ruling them. The Edo people were able to say, look, Ize Yamu is undergoing trial for 700 million um, by the EFCC, and he's already in court. There was a hearing in July. And the Edo people actually came out to say, look, we will express our views against people um, who are hamstring charges for being processed through the criminal justice, you know, to uh, present themselves as candidates for elections in a, in a state. So that is a good sign. Um, unlike what happened in Ondo State when Fayoshi came in, if you, uh, sorry, in Ekiti State, um, when Fayoshi came in, Fayoshi was going through trial, you know, for poultry scandal, and then he came back, he won elections. So I think what has happened in Edo State um, is a lesson to many uh, voters throughout the whole country that is candidates uh, with questionable character undergoing trial 
should not even be considered for offices. And I'm sure politicians will also learn from that, the political parties, that they will not be able to carry the voters along with them if you are imposing candidates you know, with questionable um, character or questionable background or undergoing trial with EFCs. Wow. So what we have seen is the triumph of the democratic will of um, those state people. The other factor which we should not sidestep is the role of Western countries in propping us to do the right thing. Um, the West made it very clear, UK and the, the USA, that look, um, if, there is, that if, the evidence, if there is any substantial evidence of interference to change the democratic will of the people, they will impose some sanctions. Normally, one should not tolerate that because Nigeria is a sovereign country and they should not be meddling in the internal politics of Nigeria. But at the end of the day, we are not yet a mature democracy. Uh, you can also see the fact that we are being nurtured. Uh, we are still being nursed you know, by yeah. uh, more developed um, economies to do the right thing. But overall, um, I commend the people of Edo State for um, protecting their votes and ensuring that their votes count. All right, uh, back to Michelle Agatissa. Now we have um, almost run out of time uh, for this conversation, uh, but I want you to quickly speak on um, the leadership, uh, leadership style of uh, Godwin Obaseki. One of the conversations before now is uh, about his style of leadership. Um, now he's been given a second chance by the people. What key areas do you think he should look into in terms of his leadership style? As quickly as possible, please. Okay. Um, yes, of course, um, in the APC, that was one of the issues, that he didn't carry people along and some thought that he was dictatorial. Um, I do not know if that is the truth because I'm not in government house with him. But that being said, um, he has to understand that he's in a new political party and um, these are people that previously had their daggers drawn against him. So he has to be quite, should I say, cooperative um, and to ensure that he governs with the people. And the political party that um, he's now um, in bed with. But that being said, to the he has said that the issues arose from his um, insistence not to share state money for petitions. Um, that is something that helped him during this election. If that is in fact the case, um, then I think it's high time that we had governors and um, elected officials who stand up for convictions and who stand. Uh, okay, we seem to have lost um, um, sound there with uh, Michelle Agatisa. Bilton Show, we'll be over to you. I think we'll uh, be wrapping up with this. Uh, the argument for staggered elections have uh, come up once again. Uh, would you say this is the way to go, even, of course, in the general election, uh, to allow for ease of uh, logistics uh, for INEC? Uh, no, actually, the staggered elections only came, came about as a result of court judgments. It was not meant to be. The reason why we've not been able to police other elections is because we do not have enough manpower. That is the first thing. So I make these logistical challenges all the time because we still do not have the necessary infrastructure in place to ensure that we can hold elections in all the states simultaneously. So um, whether we have staggered elections or not, a lot depends on the people, their willingness to protect their votes, and it also depends on the willingness of the federal government, you know, to be impartial, you know, to ensure that they do not meddle in elections. Um, yes, we have seen situations where staggered elections have worked, but we have also seen where we have problems. For instance, in Oshun State, when Arik Beshola was going for a second term, um, we saw how the security forces were deployed and used oppressively to try and thwart the witches of the people. So it can work, um, it can help when you have staggered elections, but at the same time, it could also mean when you have a president willing to subvert the will of the voters, um, they could also use that you know, to influence the process. So in, this, in the case of Edo State today, it has not worked. It remains to be seen what would happen in Ondo. All right. Michelle Agatissa, legal practitioner, and of course, uh, Biodun Shomomi, thank you so much for, uh, both, uh, for speaking with us um, on the program.
Thank you for having us. Thank you.